In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, for the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them the fire of the divine love. Send forth thy spirit, and heart shall be created. Let us pray, O God, to disinstruct the hearts of thy faithful. By the light of the Holy Ghost, grant the gifts of the same spirit. We may be always truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. St. Pius X, Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. All right, so welcome. Again, quite a few new faces, which is good to see. Um, if you haven't seen one of these already, we've got stacks of them over here with the, uh, the MI Corner. The, the flyer for the, adult catech for the adult catechism for the year, which gives you all the details as to what conferences are planned for what dates, and on the back, a, a barcode for scanning so that you can watch it, you can watch them online if you can't make everyone in person. It's also, they're there for you, but they're also there so that you can take a couple extras and give them to family or friends who may not even be able to make it here because they live in another state or, or uh, whatever it might be. Um, so please do. We printed up 1,500 of those. Thanks, to Mr. Dennis Horan. And um, it's, uh, it is good, really, to, to try to do some apostolate around the area. So you're welcome to take as many of those as you'd like. You'll notice some new titles at the MI Corner as well, at least a couple. One in particular, it's called A Right to be Merry, which is, as we look at family life, at marriage and family, but well, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that some will be called to, for example, religious life. All right? Some will be called out of the norm to something even yet higher, to religious life. And this is a great, a great book on cloistered religious life. Uh, it was a bestseller when they, when they put it out. You wouldn't think that a cloister could be so exciting, but it is so entertaining. The, uh, the writer is really a master. And she really, she, um, it's inspiring, I think, for anybody. But it also helps you understand something of the of the cloister. For those of you that are married and have been married a long time, don't you wish you had read this before? No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, no, it's uh, tonight. Tonight we begin what we could say would be a summary of some of the key elements that would go into the pre-Cana classes that we would give here at this at the at the chapel. Um, and they're going to be very similar all throughout the SSPX. A summary of the pre-Cana classes we would give to a couple who was looking to get married. All right, a couple who was preparing for marriage. It doesn't mean that we can cover absolutely everything, nor are we going to cover it all today. All right, there would be three or four essential classes, and then lots of extras as well, which we'll fill in throughout the rest of the, of the, school, of the year. But it's, um, I think it's important because some have been married a long time and they could just use a refresher. Others have been married quite some time, but maybe never received a full set of classes before their marriage or didn't receive them from the priest or didn't receive the traditional doctrine of the church. Because let's face it, we live in a crisis. And there are many times where couples approach their priest and they're told, all right, great, you want to get married, no problem. You know, we'll, we'll sort out your paperwork and then sister Mary so-and-so or this or that layperson is going to give you your classes. Um, and there's often something lost in the shuffle. All right, so it's not a one-size-fits-all, but hopefully this can serve to, to fill any holes that might be there. And then, of course, there are others of you yet who have never received this because, well, you just you haven't yet approached the sacrament of matrimony. Um, you haven't yet had the opportunity. And this gives you a bit of a, an insight uh, to the, um, you know, to the, the the material we're going to cover. At the same time, it's um, I'll, I'll just warn you up front. Even if you've been at the conferences, it doesn't. It's not a get out of jail free card. When you come by to get married, we're going to go through it again. All right, but obviously it's going to be a little bit different because it's one on one. It's just the, the couple and the priest, 
and it's a bit less formal. Um, it's more of a sit down, talk through it, see where you're at, get your questions. Um, but no, it's, it's well worth covering. What I want to point out from the beginning is that the goal is not to really give you anything strictly personal. I'll put it in my own words at times, but this is too important to just give you my own ideas. We want to lean on, we want to teach really what the Catholic Church teaches. And the Catholic Church has been very clear. We'll use as our source, first and foremost, Costi Canubi, which was an encyclical written by Pope Pius XI on Christian marriage. He wrote it in 1930. And so we'll use that. We'll also use as a secondary source, Moral Theology, a complete course by McHugh and Colin. They're Dominicans. And they put out this book in 1930 as well. All right, so it's, it goes back. This is the moral theology behind it. Books that you wouldn't get a hold of because we'll never sell them out here because they're only for moral theologians. Um, it takes a training to go through them. But I can give you excerpts. All right, so you're not going to find that one, but it's, it's a source, and I'll tell you where I'm quoting it. And then another book, the, um, it's a commentary on canon law by Buscaren and Ellis. This is a commentary on the old code of canon law. There are going to be moments where I quote the new code of canon law so that you know what the current law of the church is. But I would say for the spirit of things, we, we need to look to the old code. And I'll explain with time why that is. So this is from the, a commentary on the 1917 code of canon law. This, was, this is the third printing. So 1961 was when it was reprinted. And um, so 1917 code of canon law as distinct from the 1983 code of canon law, which is the one that's still um, in force today. All right, so to begin with, by way of introduction, we want to recap, although Father Toke has done a great job of introducing it, we want to recap the importance of marriage, particularly from the, with, the, with the mouth, you could say, of the Pope. So Pope Pius XI, Here's a, just three paragraphs, short paragraphs, from Costi Canubi. How great is the dignity of chaste wedlock, venerable brethren, may be judged best from this, that Christ our Lord, Son of the Eternal Father, having assumed the nature of fallen man, not only with His loving desire of compassing the redemption of our race, ordained it in an especial manner, ordained marriage in an especial manner, as the principle and foundation of domestic society, and therefore of all human intercourse. But also raised it. He raised it to the rank of a truly and great sacrament of the new law. He restored it to the original purity of its divine institution, and accordingly entrusted all its discipline and care to his spouse, the church. All right, so already you can see the importance with which Pope Pius XI is, is treating this. God became man to save mankind, but in the very act of doing it, he, he focused on marriage in a special way because it's the fundamental building block of society. Family is the bund fundamental building block upon which society rests. And he not only just restored it to its original unity, its original purity, he also elevated it to the level of a, of a, sac a sacrament and a great sacrament at that. And he entrusted it to the church, to his own bride, the church, to protect, to, to pass on. And that's why it only makes sense to start by, by quoting the church, by quoting Pope Pius XI. We go on. In order, however, that amongst men of every nation and every age, the desired fruits may be obtained from this renewal of matrimony, it is necessary, first of all, that men's minds be illuminated with the true doctrine of Christ regarding it. That's the first step. If this restoration of matrimony and elevation of matrimony which Christ worked, if this is going to bear its fruits, then the first thing is we have to put the, the, the doctrine of Christ on marriage in contact with individual souls. I think if he would have changed the water into wine at Cana, but then no one ever took a sip. 
they would never have known the great miracle he had worked. You have to have some contact with him. When it comes to his doctrine as well, we need contact with this, with this doctrine. And then we need to strengthen the wills of the spouses and all that. That's the rest of this paragraph. But we're going to skip through to the next point because we'll come back to the spouses later. This is paragraph 4 now of Kasti Kunubi. We have decided therefore to speak to you, venerable brethren, and through you to the whole church of Christ. Pope Pius XI was intending this for the entire Catholic Church through the bishops. Particularly, of course, the Roman Rite, which is the way that you know, the Pope would speak through his bishops. But you look at the way his, wor- his wording. And through you to the whole church of Christ and indeed to the whole human race on the nature and dignity of Christian marriage. He goes on to confirm all that Pope Leo XIII had already said in his encyclical Arcanum uh, 50 years before. He said, we hereby confirm and make our own all right, what he himself had said, what, what, what um, Leo XIII had said. All right, so what does the church teach about the nature of marriage? That's where we're starting now. And you have your handouts. It's, it's not all there, but what it does is it gives you the definitions, it gives you the properties, it gives you the ends of marriage so that as we go through it, you're not, compl- you're not lost. They overlap. All these things deal with one reality. So there, we'll be mentioning them somehow interlocked, but as you go, you'll see uh, it becomes more and more clear. We can, we can define, we can describe each element of marriage. So to begin with, what does the church teach? What is our faith about marriage? The nature of marriage. Right? We have to understand this because from this nature of marriage, the ends and the properties of marriage will flow. So what we want to look at what it is, and we want to rule out what it's not. So what is marriage? First of all, we, we often do this in the marriage classes. We'll ask the couple, you know, what do you think marriage is? Can you define it? Often those kinds of terms that we're so used to, we have a hard time putting our finger on. Well, it's, it's a man and a woman who love each other. Yes? So do a brother and sister. Uh, they share a life together. Yes? So do many other people, you know, brothers and sisters again at times, and they do share a life together. But what makes it what it is? We'll look at the, the definition from the Moral Theology book by McEwen Collin. The conjugal union of man and woman contracted between two qualified persons which obliges them to one another for life. Right? That is a definition. It's not the only definition of marriage, but it's a definition of marriage. All right? The conjugal union of man and woman contracted between two qualified persons which obliges them to one another for life. We could simplify that and say it's the conjugal union of one man and one woman for life. For life in two ways. For life meaning till death do us part. For life meaning its first purpose is children. It's meant to bring life. The conjugal union of one man and one woman for life. So now we'll go through that definition and make sure we understand the terms. What do we mean by conjugal union? It's not just a union of friendship. Of course, a marriage should be a friendship. But it's not just a friendship. It's more than a friendship. You can be friends with many. You can only have one spouse. You can be friends with someone of the same sex, but you could never make them your spouse. It's the conjugal union of one man and one woman. Conjugal union. It's more than a union of friendship. Again, from the Moral Theology Manual, the marriage union is conjugal. That is, its end is the procreation and rearing of children, or the making of a family. And it therefore gives the right to the natural acts of generation. Conjugal means that they're spouses. 
that they have rights over one another for procreation. Yes, we treat it delicately, but we have to know what marriage is. It's one of the reasons why, when the couple stands at the altar, we insist so strongly in the traditional Catholic Church that the bride be dressed modestly. Because everyone knows that marriage means you're giving yourself to one another for the acts proper and apt to procreation. And blessed by God, and it's a beautiful thing in marriage, but you're not marrying everyone in the church. You're trying to show everyone that you are going to be faithful. If you walk in in a way that shows off your body to everyone, what only your future spouse should, know, should see, what message does that send? No, marriage is too sacred for that. That's why if you get married here, right, we oblige every bride before she approaches the altar to send a picture of what she's going to wear front and back. And if we don't approve, she has to fix it or we don't go ahead with the marriage. We're not playing games with marriage. This is serious. And it's a, a foundation upon which society is built. And if marriage starts incorrect, we explain the reasons why, we help them along the best we can, we try to, we try to give them pointers before they buy their first dress so that they don't have to scrap it and waste all that money. But if we don't insist on the, let's say, the things that touch on marriage, the things that we can manage, we could be in for big difficulties later on. The couple could be in for real difficulties later on. And every family that disintegrates shakes the parish and shakes the church and shake society around. We're not, although we treat delicately the questions of, let's say, the conjugal aspects of marriage, we're not going to just step around them. We have to deal with them. We have to know what's right. We have to know what's wrong. There's a way of speaking of it which still is dignified, but there's a time and place for it. And at least to a certain extent, this will be the time and place. Not so much in this conference, although it will come up in passing, but certainly in some of the other conferences. I would say the full depth we would go into more easily when it's just a couple coming for marriage class. Because they're, they're ready for marriage. They need to know. But still, we need to have the we need to have the the, the big picture uh, in order to uh, to know what marriage is all about. God's not ashamed of it. It's not spoken of every day, not because it's shameful, but because it's sacred. And so it's reserved for the right time, the right place. And this is one of those times and places. One of the other definitions of marriage, just to give you a sample. All right, it is more explicit and yet still perfectly appropriate to the task. Marriage is the lawful and permanent contract entered into by one man and one woman who mutually and freely agree to give to each other the exclu exclusive lifelong right over their bodies for actions apt and proper for the procreation of children. That's marriage. That's from our marriage class outline specifically. So it's not in your, it's not on your handout there. It could have been. I just, it's one more definition. That's the one, the one you have is one we're going to go through in detail, but it just gives you a sample of what's out there. All right, I'm happy to share it afterwards, not a problem. All right. So it's a conjugal union between qualified persons. Qualified persons, you know there's like a 17-page exam you have to take before you get married. Uh, no, it's not true. But qualified persons means basically that you're not disqualified. There's nothing about you that disqualifies you. You're not already married to someone else who's still alive uh, that would disqualify you from a marriage to someone or to another. Um, it means that you're old enough 
It means that you're capable of the acts proper for, to procreation. And that's always assumed the case, unless there's some proof otherwise. Obviously, there's, there's a, a purity that must be maintained. And the couple should be completely pure all the way till the day they're married. Right? So that's the, that's the idea. That's the mind of the church. And it's important because courtship, we'll look at courtship later, but courtship is a time in which you prepare for marriage. You're planting seeds for a happy marriage. If you plant an acorn, you expect an oak tree to grow. If you plant impurity in courtship, it's logical to expect that infidelity will grow out of that. And that's the last thing you want. Infidelity meaning one spouse or the other or both seeking someone else after marriage. Now, people can repent, people can change. But this, don't take courtship lightly. It's not a time for, for just fooling around or having fun. Marriage has to rest on this foundation. And grace builds on nature. It doesn't just suddenly work a miracle. God can work miracles, but that's not his normal way. Between qualified persons, from Moral Theology Manual, marriages between qualified persons for certain individuals are excluded by natural law or divine law or human law from making a valid contract of marriage. You could get someone who just, they don't have the mental capacity to make that big a decision. It can be. It's not every day, but you could have someone that law would say, no, you have to be accomplice mentees. You're, 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 not in your, you're not in your right mind. It may not be your fault. But you're not in your right mind. You can't get married. You can't, you can't commit to something that you don't understand. At the same time, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to confect a valid marriage. We're not going to go through all the impediments here. That could be something touched on perhaps at another time. It's the conjugal union between qualified persons, between two qualified persons. All right, again, the, the moral theology manual. Marriage is between two, one man and one woman. This unity of marriage is its first property. Unity means one man, one woman, exclusive to anyone else, when you marry her, you give up every other woman in the world. Or when you marry him, you give up every other man in the world. It's a great act. There's a unity. It's between two, the two become one. The unity of marriage is its first property, resulting from its nature as a relationship intended what? Here we have the first end of marriage. A relationship intended primarily for the propagation of the human race and its proper upbringing. And secondarily, for the peace and contentment of the married couple, their mutual assistance to one another, and their protection against carnal temptations. So there you have the first property of marriage, unity, and you have the two ends of marriage. The primary end of marriage, which is the procreation and education of children, which is best done by one couple, just think of when you've got auntie so-and-so living in the house and she's got different ideas of, of child rearing than mom does. And suddenly you've got two methods with the same children torn between the two. No, it has to be mom and dad working together. Doesn't mean that auntie can't come visit. Doesn't mean that grandma can't come visit. But there can only be one mother in that household. And there can only be one father in that household. And of course, it's for children. And let's face it, they need you a good long time. It can't just be a temporary thing. Let's say you have your first child. Let's say a young woman gets married, has her first child. It wouldn't be unreasonable to think she has her first child at age 22. Not, not impossible at all. Let's say she has her first child at 20. Let's say she has her, she's married at 22, has her first child at 23. You know how long it takes to raise one of those little things? Right? If she's 23 and then she, the child might be able to kind of manage at about 18, but still going to need some guidance to get settled. 
They won't really get settled in their own home until they're probably 22, 23. At that point, you're already 44, all right? And that's your first. You got married when you were 23. You, got, you had your first child when you were 23. You might have your last child when you're 45. Add another 23 years to that 45 before that last child has grown up and gone. No wonder marriage is for life. At the, at the end of that, you're worn out. It's not the time to go looking for somebody else. You, you need to help each other in your old age. I mean, that's just the way it goes. I, a little exaggerated, but... And you got grandkids coming. When you marry, it's not just for your kids, it's for your grandkids too. And your great-grandkids. And hopefully even your great-greats. By that time, well... They like, you spoil them and they're happy to see you. You're not contributing a whole lot, I suppose. But your fidelity is, is massive. All right? You're not going to be the one disciplining them or changing their nappies at that point. All right? When they're, they're your great greats. But if you're still married to your, to their great great grandfather or grandmother, that speaks volumes more than anyone else in the world can say virtually. That would be a book. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Sounds like what St. Peter said. <laughs> no, it's, it's for life. It's, there's a reason it's one man and one woman. And let's face it, it takes you a lifetime just to figure each other out. Men and women are so different. And there's such a depth to each character, each personality. Oh. All right. So we've got the, the first property, unity, and then we've got the, the two ends, the primary end, which is the procreation and education of children, and then the secondary end, which always has to be subservient to the first, and that is mutual support and remedy for concupiscence, meaning a lawful appeasement through marriage of temptations let's say, inclinations of the flesh. Right? In marriage, it's not a temptation anymore towards one's spouse because it's blessed. But there's an inclination which, if it's out of place, is a temptation. Well, the fact that you have a spouse that you have to be faithful to and that you love helps you say, no, I'm not going to give time to anyone else or anything else of that sort. I have my spouse and I love them and only them in this way. It obliges to one another for life. All right, it's between two, and this, this contract obliges them to one another for life. This indissolubility of marriage is its second property. Again, this is from the Moral Theology Manual. This indissolubility of marriage is its second property, and also follows from the natural ends of marriage. As we just said, children need help for a long time. For the right propagation of the human race is a matter that concerns not merely the married couple, or human society, but also God himself, who is matrimony's immediate author and lawgiver. God made marriage. And he made its laws. And God has decreed that marriage be unbreakable, except in the few instances allowed by himself. What God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. It's Matthew chapter 19, verse 6. So, that's the definition of marriage. Obviously, it's clear that marriage is a contract. It's a contract between husband and wife. All right? But who made this contract? God did. God sets the terms. You might, some might be tempted to think like the world, that, well, because it's a contract between two people, they get to set the terms. You're allowed to write your own marriage vows. No, you're not. You're not obliged to enter marriage. But if you choose to do so, it's on God's terms, period. God made your nature. God created and He made you as an individual. And He created marriage as an institution. And He will be the one who, for you, it'll be a sacrament. He will be the one who... who gives you the sacrament through your exchange of vows, through your contract. God sets the terms. Think of it this way. And this is not just for Catholics. This is for everybody. 
This is not just for... This is for the pagans out in the middle of nowhere who have never even heard of the faith. All right? Marriage is for life. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Whether it's a sacrament, well, it's all the more so. But even for those who are just, for whom it's just a natural contract, like before, like in the Old Testament, or those who are not baptized, if they're not baptized, they can't receive a sacrament. Baptism is the gateway to all the other sacraments. So two pagans who are never baptized, they can marry each other validly. It's a natural contract. But it's for life. It's indissoluble. It's for life. They're not a, it's not like, well, Catholics can't get divorced, but the rest of the world can. No, they cannot. If it's a true marriage, it's for life. That's the way God made it. What if they don't know? What if they don't know about the laws of marriage? What if they don't know about the rules of governing, let's say, the, even the intimacies in marriage? What if they don't know the rules? Well, then they'll probably end up breaking those rules. Oh, but Father, they don't know better, so it's not a sin. All right. It's true. For a mortal sin, they have to have knowledge and consent. If they don't know, they don't know. They're still going to get hurt. Their marriage is still going to suffer. Even in the best case scenarios where they really honestly don't know better, they're still going to get hurt. Think of the laws. Think of the, the laws of nature. For example, gravity. Your, your little four-year-old can't define gravity for you. He might not even know what it is, but he's going to feel it if he falls off a ladder. He's still going to get hurt, even if he doesn't understand why. And same with marriage. We break the laws of marriage, even if it's unknowing. If we break those laws, the marriage is going to suffer. And if you do know and you break those laws, obviously it's also a sin. That's why we have to know these things. God is the author. For the right propagation of the human race is a matter that concerns not merely the married couple or human society, but also God Himself, who is matrimony's immediate author and lawgiver. And God has decreed that marriage be unbreakable. So it's unbreakable. Now it's a contract whose terms are set by God Himself. Yes, there are laws of nature. There are also, there's also natural law. And this unbreakableness of marriage falls there. It's in the way that God made marriage. We need to debunk the, the modern concept, this modern attack on God. You know, God, religion, needs to stay out of the, out of the bedroom. Religion it has nothing to say there. Wait, wait a minute. God created the wood out of which your bed is made. And He made you. And He made your house. And He made your nature. And He made na marriage. And He holds you in existence at every moment. And He made the laws that govern marriage. Don't say He doesn't have a right to do that. There is no part of our life where God has to say, well, that's off limits for me. We are His creatures. He made us from nothing. At the same time, God and the church doesn't complicate things. When God makes laws, it's because He knows that those laws will protect the institution He has created, and they will lead, if we follow those laws, they will lead us to the greatest possible happiness. He doesn't make laws for the sake of complications. He doesn't make laws just to you know, to somehow deprive you of something. He makes laws so that your marriages will be as happy as possible and that you will be as holy as possible. Again, Kosti Kunubi, therefore the sacred partnership of true marriage is constituted both by the will of God and the will of man. From God comes the very institution of marriage and the ends for which it was instituted the laws that govern it and the blessings that flow from it. All of that comes from God. Man gives his consent. You don't have to enter marriage. But if you do, it's on his terms. Again, Kosti Kanubi, Yet although matrimony is of its very nature, of divine institution, the human will too enters into it. 
inasmuch as it is a conjugal union of a particular man and a woman, and woman, arises only from the free consent of each of the spouses. This freedom, however, regards only the question whether the, whether the contracting parties really wish to enter upon matrimony or to marry this particular person. But the nature of matrimony is entirely independent of the free will of man, so that one, so that if one has once contracted matrimony, he is thereby subject to its divinely made laws and its essential properties. This is the teaching of the church. I'm not just making it up. God set the rules for marriage. That's why, no, no matter what the state says, no matter how much they want to persecute us, it will never be allowed or something that we can bless. Right? Same-sex couples, not possible. God didn't make it that way. The elements of the contract of marriage. What are the elements of the contract of marriage? You have this in your handout about halfway down. First of all, this comes again from the marriage manual, the moral theology manual. The subject matter of the contract is the conjugal right or the lawful power of exercising with the other party acts suitable for generation. We often use those terms, acts suitable for generation, or apps act, acts apt to procreation, right? or the marriage act, or the marriage embrace. We're talking about all this. Every time we use those words, we mean the same thing. All right? We're referring to sexual intercourse. We don't use that term as frequently because it's been given such a, just a, it doesn't have to have it, but in this world, it has taken on such a sensual flair that we try to use other terms that remind us of the sacredness of the reality within marriage. Kosti Kanubi, nor must we omit to remark and find that since the duty entrusted to parents for the good of their children is of such high dignity and of such great importance, every use of the faculty given by God for the procreation of new life is the right and the privilege of the married state alone. By the law of God and of nature, and must be confined absolutely within the sacred limits of that state. Because of the duty entrusted to parents, because of the great dignity and importance, all, right, all that is sexual is reserved for marriage. Period. All right, we want to be very clear there. Again, that's Kosti Kanubi. It's the teaching of the church. Let's be very clear. To purposely seek or accept sexual pleasure outside of marriage, outside of the lawful use of marriage, is mortal sin. Immodesty in dress, it can be a little immodest. It can be venial. Not with, not with the sexual. To purposely, so impurity and immodesty, although they're related cousins, they're different. Impure, immodesty can be venial. Impurity, if there's full knowledge and full consent, all right, if there's a purposeful seeking or accepting of sexual pleasure outside of marriage, outside of the lawful use of marriage, it's a mortal sin. No matter what the world says. No matter what the movies portray. And this is crucial to understand or we set our young couples up for difficulties in their marriage. The ends of marriage. All right, What are the ends of this contract? In other words, what are the goals or the purpose? The purposes. All right? Not just goals and purposes that we set, but goals and purposes that God built into marriage. He built the machine. What is it meant for? Where is it going? What's its goal? It's not a machine. It's, it's you got individual lives and hearts at stake. God made this. What is it made for? Primarily the good of the race. Primarily the good of the race and of the children. Without marriages, the human race dies out. Secondarily, secondarily the good of the couple. 
through mutual assistance and protection in spiritual and temporal matters. Don't marry someone that's not going to help you get to heaven. But don't marry someone who's not going to be good to your kids. Don't marry someone who's not going to be open to life. The first purpose of marriage is children. And the love of the couple, that's why at the marriage day everyone looks and goes, oh, it's your big day. That's your future children's big day. It is your big day too. I mean, by all means, marriages can be a, a very beautiful thing. But it's beautiful because it's not about this couple. They're laying down their lives for one another and in this united life, they're, they're going to be open to children if God so chooses to send them. <clears throat> the essence of the contract is the consent. For every pact, this is moral theology, for every pact consists in mutual agreement. Marriage consent must have the qualities that are necessary in every contract. All right? What are those qualities? The consent must be internal, it must be external, it must be mutual, and it must be free. All right? Go over, going over those briefly. Internal, it means that when, when you say I do, all right, at the altar, what your consent, it has to be internal. You're not just putting on a play. All right? Well, we're playing house, and we walk down the aisle, and then we say the words. That's not a marriage because you're just playing around. If it's real, internally, you have to be intending to enter matrimony. Internal, that is, one must accept in will and not merely in words the proposal or consideration offered by the other party. In this case, marriage. Again, this is moral theology. If both or one of the parties internally and positively wills to exclude marriage or the right to the conjugal act or an essential property of marriage, the contract is null since there is no purpose to contract a real marriage. So someone who goes into marriage internally saying, I do, so externally saying, I do, but internally saying, I will never have children. Never. I'm not open to children. I'll never have children. Invalid marriage. You might not be able to prove it. It's harder to prove these internal things. doesn't mean you're going to get an easy annulment. How do you prove something like that? But it's mortal sin, and it's actually an invalid marriage. Mm -hmm. Well, are you the innocent party or the guilty party? <laughs> it makes a difference. If you're the innocent party, you probably don't know he did it. All right. Um, and if he, if he, if you do know, then you bring it to the priest and say, "Father, can you help us get this sorted?" If you're sure. All right. If you're the guilty party. All right, on the outside, all right, well, this is basically, I'll, I'll give you the answer in moral, moral theological terms, but if you're the guilty party and it was just you withheld your consent, but everything on the outside was valid, it's just because of an internal flaw, then you're obliged to make internal consent to rectify that or to pay the damages to your spouse. You have to treat everything on the outside as if it's normal, all right, but you got to work it out. Doesn't mean you have to go back and find your old dress, all right? But you have to you have to right the wrong, all right? So this is moral theology. If one consents to the obligations but does not intend to fulfill them, so consents to the obligations but does not intend to fulfill them, the contract is valid but unlawful. It's mortal sin, but it's valid. All right. So let me let me finish. Um, one who contracts invalidly sins, and is bound in the external forum to keep the contract seriously made. And in the internal forum, to repair the damage to the other party by giving true consent or making restitution. All right, so, one who contra contracts invalidly. Th these are, this is, th these are uh, quotes that are regarding, let's say, um, no, this is, yeah? Yeah. No, so I'm saying if, if he's entered an invalid marriage because he knows he withheld consent, he didn't intend to have any children ever, and then he repents of it later or he recognizes it later, what does he have to do? He has to take away that, that internal reservation 
he has to will here and now to enter marriage properly. Right? Because the outside, you're not going to get remarried. Outside was all fulfilled. It's the inside that was a problem. You have to take away that obstacle. So I'll repeat. Yep. Yeah. Well, the innocent party wouldn't know. So the innocent party wouldn't, wouldn't know that they were complicit to evil. But it, objectively, it was evil. But that's it. You don't know the inside of the other person's heart. You have to trust the best. If you don't trust them, don't marry them. But, you know, that's it. You, we have to have these things. And these days, what does this mean? How many people out there don't, I mean, explicitly reject God's law in essential matters? I'm not saying necessarily Catholics, but how many of the, the Protestants out there as well, till death to his part, as long as I love you, no, it's to that you part. All right, the essential properties. Let me repeat that. One who contracts invalidly sins and is bound in the external forum to keep the contract seriously made. So on the outside, everything has to look normal. And in the internal forum, between him and his spouse, or her and his, her spouse, she and her spouse, and in the internal forum, to repair the damage to the other party by giving true consent or making restitution. How you make restitution for ruining someone's life you got me. I don't know. One who contracts unlawfully, all right, so it's valid but unlawful because of something else, something short. Well, they also sin, and they're bound to the engagement. All right. Um, 19, yes? Sorry. I actually know a couple. One of them is my friend. Okay. Um, He wants to have children, so he kept, he was so excited that they had that he's getting married. Mm -hmm. But he didn't pay much attention to it. But later mm -hmm. on, it's been now a couple of decades that they've been married. They still no children. He still doesn't want to have children. It's it, probably the younger childbearing years. Should he marry and be? He should talk to a priest. He should talk to a priest. It doesn't mean that he can necessarily get an annulment. I'm not saying that, but he should talk to a priest. Yeah. No, I mean, there are laws we just can't play with, right? At the same time, the presumption is always, always, always in favor of the validity of the marriage unless proven otherwise. That's moral theology and canon law. The presumption is always in favor of the validity of marriage unless we can prove in a court of law or unless you know in your heart of hearts because you made the reservation, right? We always have to treat it as a valid marriage unless we're absolutely sure otherwise. You can't go... Question: You can't go assuming that maybe your spouse has had a secret intention. You can't act on that. All right. Um, 1917 Code of Canon Law. All right. Speaks about the the uh, presumption in favor of the validity of the marriage, and so does the 1983 Code. It's Canon 1060. Marriage possesses the favor of the law. Therefore, in a case of doubt, the validity of Marriage must be upheld until the contrary is proven. Right? That's for everyone's benefit. Right? If you start and go, oh, I've just got this little doubt. I, do I have to suddenly you know, step away from my spouse? And, no. If there's no grounds, if there's no, nothing proven, the benefit of the doubt is in your favor. We don't start scrupling everything. All right? Um, Yep, so internal, external, mutual, and free. So that was the internal. External, one must manifest in some sensible way one's agreement to the proposition contained in the contract. In this case, it's the marriage contract. So it has to be legitimately and externally manifested that you want to marry. All right, so your bride's crying is not enough. <laughs> you might do it. It's all right. We even have Kleenexes there for you. But, but tissues. But crying is not enough. You have to squeak out a I do. Or at least give me a thumbs up. All right? Yeah, I need something externally manifested. All right? And sometimes it's rough. Uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't stop there. I, <laughs> I suppose it depends on the culture. Um, <laughs> here in Australia, probably no problem at all. Um, <laughs> no. Nah. The, um, but it's true, when the, 
emotions do amazing things at those moments, all right? And often you would never, you, won't, you wouldn't believe how you can be swept through with emotion all of a sudden, even though you've always thought of this day, you've always, but you didn't expect to tear up. Fair enough. Everyone just stays calm, and we just wait. Because you have to say, I do. All right? You have to say it. And you have to say it loud enough that your best man and maid of honor, your witnesses, can hear it and can sign to it. All right? You have to say, I do. That to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, that's all spelling it out more and more and more. But that, that's not necessary for validity. The I do is necessary. The mutual, all right, mutual I do. That's the third, the third point. Both parties intend marriage and offer consent. They have to both offer it. It's mutual. It's contemporaneous. It doesn't mean that it's simultaneous. We don't have to say, do you take him and you take her. Now, all together, one, two, three, I do. Now, it's not simultaneous. It's contemporaneous. So, he says, I do. And that I do lasts all the way until she has a chance to answer or until he runs out of the chapel in fear. All right? So once he says, I do, if he doesn't retract it, it's understood that that's still there. And then when she says, I do, it's a sacrament. Right there. Contemporaneous. From tempore in Latin. At the same time. Uh, let's say, mm, yes, it's not at the same time. It's contemporaneous. I don't know how else to say Ah, all right, that's a good question. So it has to be expressed in the present, all right? The marriage vows have to be expressed in the present. Now, in the Latin, it is in the present, volo, which is I will, with my, with my will. I will, not I will tomorrow, I will marry you someday, I will. You've been saying that for how many weeks? Now, when you say, I will, at the altar, if you use that formula, it's I do, all right? It's present volo. It's my will moves now, all right? So, yes, in the Latin, it's volo, all right? Most, in most ceremonies, we, we would do, uh, I'm, it's open, it's not a problem, because they both mean the same thing. But in English, it's better English to say, I do. It's clearer, because it's clear it's now, all right? Do you take, I do, all right? Um, do you take them as your lawful spouse according to the rights of Holy Mother of the Church? I do. All right. um, in this case, silence does not give consent. You have to say it. All right. Silence in this case is not sufficient. Tears are not sufficient. Why? You might go, but Father, you can see I'm so moved. I love him so much. All right. Or it could be the man. I mean, I remember my, one of my sisters, she came walking down the aisle. I was, I was the celebrant for her marriage. She comes walking down there. And she was all smiles, just radiant. And her husband was up at the front, <laughs> wiping his eyes. And, and she just had this big smile. It was so beautiful, really. It was, <laughs> it was, uh, it was really impressive. You don't know who it's going to hit, all right? But you still have to get it out. Silence doesn't give consent. In this case, tears don't give consent. Because it might mean that you might be crying because someone's got a sniper's rifle, you know, <laughs> in the choir loft. Aiming at your head if you don't say I do. <laughs> we use shotguns. <laughs> Free. It must have the advertence and voluntariness necessary for a human act. There are things that we call acts of man, like blinking or your heart beating. It's an act of a man, it's an act of a human being, but it's not a human act. You don't have a choice. To, for, try, go ahead. Just try to stop your heart from beating. Right? You can stop breathing for a time. You can even keep your eyes open for a time. But you can't stop your heart from beating. That's, a human, that's an act of man, not a human act. This has to have the advertence, all right, the, the thought, and the voluntariness, the will, of a human act. It's a contract. And since the contract is of grave import, there should be the same kind of deliberation as is necessary for the commission of a mortal sin. Full knowledge, full consent. doesn't mean, let's say, sufficient knowledge, full consent. 
Doesn't mean that you know absolutely everything about marriage and all that's kind of come down the road. And you know, now this, you know, oh well, lack of due discretion is a very common ground for annulment these days in the modern church. Nonsense. It's nonsense. You mean to tell me that these two young people didn't know anything about marriage? Doesn't take much. I'm not saying they were the most mature in the world, but it doesn't take much. Someone should have noticed if they were that immature. If they could sign a contract for a car, if they could sign up for the military, they can sign up for marriage. Try that one for the military. Yeah, I think I'm going to get out of, you know, I, I need to be excused from my commitment because I, I was just, you know, I, I wasn't quite mature. Yeah, tell me about it. All right. Um, at the same time, there does have to be sufficient knowledge. That's why getting married, if you, if you were totally intoxicated when you married, it's not valid. But Father, I intended to marry before. Yeah, but when you said I do, you didn't even know where you were. You, almost, you were looking at the wrong girl. <laughs> no, it's not valid. You didn't know what you were doing. Canon 1103 and 1983 code declares a marriage to be invalid if entered into because of force or grave fear from without. And McHugh and Cullen, the Moral Theology book, specifies that to invalidate, the fear must be to escape an evil inflicted or threatened, all right, a fear that is grave, external, and unjustly caused. Unjustly caused. So if it was just, look, you mistreated my daughter, She's going to have your child. You better consider marriage. I'm not going to kill you if you don't, but I'm going to take you to I'm going to take you to court. That wouldn't invalidate a marriage. There's some justice to it. I'm not saying it's the best way, but it wouldn't intrinsically invalidate a marriage. Put a rifle to his head. Now that invalidates marriage. All right. Um, but it has to be. So it also has to be external. So for example, if you're on a ship, a cruise, and suddenly there's a big storm and you're, you know, you're with the girl of your dreams and the storm comes up and you're, you're terribly afraid you're going to lose her forever and everything is, everyone's going to sink and, and you grab the minister and you, know, you grab the priest and you make your vows. You know, it's now or never. We've got to marry before we die. And you marry. The sun, it's valid. Amen. You survived that Lord, crash. You married. It, no, it was an internal. It was, it was, yes, there was an external storm. But, but the fear it wasn't unjust in the least. And it wasn't someone inflicting it on you. It was nature around you. You chose to marry. So be careful what you do in a storm. <laughs> Canon 1103. Oh, uh, no, we've already done that one. I'm sorry, we're running a little late. We got started a bit late. A little bit more. What degree of knowledge is required? What degree of knowledge is required all right, for a valid marriage? The Roman Rhoda on the 20th of January, 1926, issued the following decision. All right, it's not much. Listen to this. Quote, It is not necessary that the parties explicitly intend to assume all the rights and duties which derive from the nature of marriage. But it is sufficient that they in a general way intend to contract marriage as others do, or as it was instituted by God. They might not know all, they might not be able to list all the properties of marriage. Or they might not be able to tell you the definition of marriage. But if they intend to enter marriage as instituted by God, that's enough. Nor is it necessary that they know the way in which children are procreated, provided they do know that it is done by their own mutual cooperation. That's from the commentary of canon law, uh, the, the commentary on canon law, the 1917 code. The new code specifies a little further in canon 1096, paragraph 1. For matrimonial consent to exist, the contracting parties must be at least not ignorant that marriage is a permanent partnership between a man and a woman ordered to the procreation of offspring by means of some sexual cooperation. Doesn't take much for the consent to be there. All right. 
The ends of marriage all right, are something we've already touched on, all right, but I think what we need to insist on is that the primary end of marriage is the procreation of children and the education of those children. It's not just to have children, that's crucial, but it's to educate them for heaven. It doesn't mean you have to send them all to Yale. All right, well, we can only have two kids because we can only afford the, the best universities for two or three. No, you're not obliged to send them. That's not what we mean by educating your kids. It means raising them, forming them into good human beings and then into good Catholics so they can get to heaven. And that's, again, that's canon law and moral theology. But the old code of canon law was very clear on it. All right, this is the old code of canon law. The primary end of marriage is the procreation and education of children. Very clear. Canon 10.13. The primary end of marriage is the procreation and education of children. Right? And its secondary end is mutual help and the allaying of concupiscence. That's again, the old code of canon law. Yeah. The primary end of marriage is the procreation and education of children. Its secondary end is mutual help and the allaying of concupiscence. Next paragraph of the old code of canon law, the essential properties of marriage are unity and indissolubility, which acquire a, a peculiar firmness in Christian marriage by reason of its sacramental character. Now, let's compare that with the new code of canon law, 1983 code. This is one of our big problems with the new code of canon law. It's been Vatican IIized, all right? Um, it's been updated to match modern notions and the ways of the world. All right? Listen to this. This is the new code, 1983, canon 1055, paragraph 1. The matrimonial covenant by which a man and a woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole life and which is ordered by its nature to the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament between the baptized. They've inversed the orders. They don't talk about remedy for concupiscence. But they, they don't say the first purpose is the mutual love of the spouses. They don't say the first purpose. They just list it first. You don't do that in law unless you're trying to change something. Lawyers are picky about everything. If you change the order in law, it's because you're changing the mindset. Now, why is that such a big deal? Because if you change the mindset and make the first purpose of marriage, mutual love of the couple, mutual support of the couple, you've opened the door to contraception within marriage. Because a couple might say, well, we, we need these signs of affection for one another. We need this right now. But we cannot and we will not have children. So we're going to use something to stop children. But we do have, we have every right to still uh, express our love in this way. No. No. God made the rules of marriage. And that is a disaster of a change in canon law. It's inexcusable. And it's condemned beforehand. All right, The Holy Office decreed on the 1st of April, 1944. Again, stressed the primacy of procreation and education, condemning, condemning the views of, quote-unquote, certain writers. This is well before the New Code. Condemning the view, views of, quote-unquote, certain writers who either deny that these con constitute the primary end or hold that the secondary ends are, quote, equally principal and independent, unquote. Pope Pius XII, in an allocution on the 29th of October, 1951, accepts the responsibility for this declaration and confirms it. It's not optional. The new Code of Canon Law got it wrong. Terribly wrong. 1944, April 1st, 1944, from the Holy Office, and then con confirmed by Pope Pius XII on the 29th of October, 1951. All right. Um... Heretic? Uh, you'd have to go into all the questions of is it... Yeah, we'd have to, we'd have to look at it closely to be able to say it explicitly. But certainly they're not following church teaching. 
right? They're not following the church teaching. Now, we could look in more detail at unity, but we already looked at it to a certain point. Um, I would just say there, all right, the whole mindset of Pope Pius XI is so foreign to that of fiducia supplicans, all right? It's, it, it's, you read through Kasi Kanubi, um, it's so clear that he has no time for unions that are not blessed by God. You'd say he has no time for unions that are ignoble, that are perverse. All right, look, he says, it's in paragraph 7. Hence, the nature of this contract, true marriage, which is proper and peculiar to it alone, makes it entirely different from both the union of animals entered into by blind instinct of nature alone, in which neither reason nor free will plays a part, and also completely distinct from the haphazard unions of men, which are far removed from all honorable unions, from all true and honorable unions of will, and enjoying none of the rights of, the, of family life. That's Pope Pius XI. And he says... Seeing deep, seeing all the way the world around us from our watchtower, he says, deeply, we, seeing deeply grieve with us that a great number of men, forgetful of the divine work of redemption, entirely ignore or shamelessly deny the great sanctity of Christian wedlock, or relying on the false principles of a new and utterly perverse morality, too often trample it underfoot. And since these most pernicious errors and depraved morals, have begun to spread even amongst the faithful and are gradually gaining ground. In our office as, vicar, as Christ's vicar upon earth and supreme shepherd and teacher, we consider it our duty to raise our voice to keep the flock committed to our care from poisoned pastures and as far as in us lies to preserve it from harm. If only Pope Francis would call out the poisoned pastures that are being spread and, and sown all around us. All right, so we'll leave it at there for tonight. There is a little bit more I would have liked to cover. Um, what we're going to do, because we're already well over time, I'm just going to give you a blessing, and then I'll stay up at the front if anyone wants to stick around and ask questions or, or come forward individually. Thank you for your patience. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti Descendat Super Vos, Amen.